Welcome to Wisdom Trek with Gramps. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, and we are on day 2,324 of our trek. The purpose of Wisdom Trek is to create a legacy of wisdom, to seek out discernment and insights, and to boldly grow where few have chosen to grow before. We are continuing the messages I delivered at Putnam Congregational Church over the past year. This is the fifth of 11 message series covering the letter to the Philippians. This message is titled, A Christ-like Descent into Greatness. I pray that it will be a conduit of learning and encouragement for you. Now, last week, we looked at the lives of two devout people, persons, who waited all their lives for the coming Messiah and a message titled, The Oldest Bucket List, and that was Simeon and Anna. But this week, we return from our Christmas messages and take up where we left off before Advent in our study of a letter to the church at Philippi. And today we're going to uh, explore a Christ-like descent into greatness. And our passage today is Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. It's on page 1827 of your pew Bibles, if you'd like to follow along, starting with verse 1 of chapter 2. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit... If any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself and becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Now, as we transition from the first chapter of Philippians to the second, we need to step back just a moment and look at one of the key verses in this epistle, and that's Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. And this is Christ proclaiming, For to me, living means living for Christ. But dying is even better. See, Paul knew that his martyrdom to be ushered into the presence of Christ would be a great gain for him. But he also knew that God had much work for him to do in the here and now. He was called to encourage others to live like Christ. But the question it begs is, how do we live, truly live, like Christ? How do we possibly begin to even take one step closer toward the greatness of Christ as he exhibited as that God-man? How can we become an imager like Christ? Is there a specific set of deeds that we should do? No, that would be fruitless. Do we attempt to mimic his miracles? That would be impossible. Do we become little gods or messiahs and conform to his divine nature? Some might say that's blasphemy. No, we are told that it will take what it takes in the first part of Philippians 2. And it's really quite simple. We can reduce it just to two words. And those two words, if we truly want to become like Christ, is selfless humility. And just because it's simple doesn't mean it's easy, though. Genuine Christ-likeness means embodying and expressing a virtue that's rarely seen here among humankind on earth. But when it is, we can begin to experience what it is to live like Christ. If you turn your bulletin insert today, and if you'll notice, the main bulletin doesn't have a back page to it, or the back page is a beautiful picture. So I've included the back page of the bulletin on the insert, but on the inside, You look on the, it's folded on the inside. Let's look at the Christ-like descent into greatness. And the theme for today's message is selfless humility, as that graphic displays a downward path to greatness. And this is really living 
So the question is, what's the secret to a great life? People have pondered this question from the beginning of time, for millennia. Long before there was any self-help sections of our bookstores or some twinkle-eyed preacher trading in shallows, believe in yourself platitudes. And before our cabinets were full of supplements and drugs to increase our energy and enhance our effectiveness, we knew and know the secret to a great life. The Bible's answer to this question isn't long or convoluted or even complex, as I've already indicated. We can sum it up in just two words. To live a great life is to live a life of selfless humility. Not the kind that we conjure up through mantras or summon through meditation or instill through a method of behavior modification. Those are temporary. The supernatural kind of selfless humility is the source of our identity identification with Christ and being an imitator of Christ. And when we do this, our lives will result in love and fellowship and affection and compassion in unity and service and in joy. Of all these virtues, Christ embodied selfless humility and it sums up his character very well. Jesus himself taught his disciples this. In Matthew chapter 20, verses 26 through 28, he was teaching his disciples. He says, but among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and give his life as a ransom for many. So Christ taught us through his words and his actions a descent into greatness. And Paul unpacks his principles in verses 1 through 11 of chapter 2. But he begins with those first four verses of this passage. It's a tangible result of Christ's likeness, which is selfless humility. It's before focusing then, and he gives us some examples of what Christ did to display his selfless humility in verses 5 through 11. But the Greek text in the first four verses, there's only one imperative in those four verses. It says, Make my joy complete. This was a command or an imperative in verse 2. But before that, in verse 1, is a logical or theological basis for the motivation for this command that Paul gave us. Now, Paul uses a, what Greek scholars call first-class condition. He uses four ifs in verse 1, and they aren't meant to indicate any type of uncertainty on Paul's part as if Paul wasn't sure whether any encouragement in Christ, comfort from his love, common sharing in the spirit, and tender and compassion in a Christian life. He didn't wonder if those would create a Christian life. Instead, these are assumed to be true. These are rhetorical questions. Paul knew the answer to them, but he put them in a form of an if question. The if clause causes, clauses imply a logical or reasonable relationship. It says, because these things are true, then there should be some sort of effect because of that. It's like a dad saying to his son, if you are my son, and if I am your father, and if you're only seven, and if I am the head of the house, then go clean your room. There wasn't any wondering whether any of those were true. He knew they were true. And he was able to give a command based on that. On the other side of this pivotal command, make my joy complete, stand four means by which Paul's joy would be filled by those in the Philippians' response. And I've included this in your bulletin insert. So let's go through that just as an exercise today. The request in two, verse 2 mirror the positive assertions in verse 1. In the left-hand column, because these things are true, then make my joy complete, by showing these results. So let's go through these four. Because you're being united with Christ, then make my joy complete by being like-minded. Because of your comfort from his love, then make my joy complete by having that same love. Because we have a common sharing in the spirit, make my joy complete by being of one spirit. And because these, that you have tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being of one mind. What is it like when it says 
being like-minded. Does that mean that all believers are expected to agree on every minor issue of doctrine? Are we to all conform to one dress code? Are we to, to suppress our individuality? No. It means that we're going to get along by agreeing on the supremacy of Christ and the centrality of the fundamentals of our faith. In light of the spiritual oneness in Christ, Paul encourages us to be in harmony, not discord, to be in unity, but not in uniformity. In a Christ-like unity, believers maintain a selfless love toward each other as a direct response because we have the same goal. And we like to think of our vocation in life as what we do for a living. But our vocation, that's our occupation. Our vocation is the same for every believer. It's proclaiming Christ and helping others grow in their relationship with him. So you might do something else for an occupation, but your vocation as a believer, as a Christ follower, is proclaiming Christ and helping others grow in their relationship with him, building God's kingdom. That's our vocation here on earth because that's our calling for every believer, regardless of what we do as an occupation. Now, the great Bible teacher of yesteryear, Harry Ironside, he offers us some insight on how the church can uh, achieve this Philippians chapter 2, verse 2 style of unity, even if we have diversity among each other. And he says, it is very evident that Christians will never see eye to eye on all points. We are so largely influenced by habits, by environment, by education, by the measure of intellectual or spiritual apprehension to which we have attained that it is an impossibility to find any number of people who look at everything from the same standpoint. How then can we be of one mind? The mind of Christ is a lowly mind. And if we are all of this mind, we shall work together in love, considering one another and seeking rather to be helpers of one another's faith than challenging each other on our convictions. This one mind that Paul urges us in the Philippians he urges us to have selfless humility. But how is such a feat accomplished? How can we be selfless and humble? I know I struggle with it. Most humans that I know of struggle with it. How can such a feat be accomplished? Paul provides a snapshot of selfless humility in verses 3 and 4. Those who embody a Christ-like virtue will not let selfishness or conceit be a motivator of their attitudes, their words, or actions. They regard others as more important than themselves. They won't limit their focus to just their own interest. They'll give their attention to the needs of others. By say, but saying this, that you'll behave in this way, and doing it are certainly two different things. I think we all struggle with that. We'd like to be good people. We'd like to be selfless. But so many times we're rooted in that selfishness of ourselves. And that's why Paul's next crux is selfless humility. And selfless humility is found in the person and work of Christ. So we continue on in our passage today, verses 5 through 11. And it'll be on the right-hand side of your bulletin insert. Christ Jesus is the supreme example of the source of true selfless humility. In one of the most elo eloquent passages of all of Scripture, and it has to be in this in Philippians chapter 2, it just blows my mind as I read it. It's regard rightly regarded. It was an, actually a hymn in the early church in the Greek language. It was a hymn that was sung. Paul describes Christ's glorious death and gl glorious life both before and after his selfless humility as expressed in his incarnation and death on the cross. In verse 5, Paul sets up this hymn, getting ready to sing it, which is relayed then, the song, hymn itself is in verses 6 through 11. He says, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. In order to sing this hymn properly, you must have this mindset of Christ Jesus. To understand the extent of selfless humility expected as followers of Christ, we're to look to the one whose humility was in the flesh, humility incarnate. And that's expected of the followers of Christ. 
we who look at the one who was humility in the flesh. We reflect on his person and his work, letting this reflect and form our minds to invade our hearts. It will transform our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. And this song that Paul has written here, this Christ hymn it's called, is outlined in three basic movements, and I've listed these in your bulletin insert, but let me read them first before we go into in, in detail. The first movement is, in verse 6, the Son of God in glory before coming to earth. The second movement is the Son of God in selfless humility while being here on earth, in verses 7 and 8. And the third movement in verses 9 through 11 is the Son of God in glory after leaving back to earth, ascending to heaven. And in your bulletin insert, let's look at that first movement. The Son of God in glory before coming to earth in verse 6. See, prior to his incarnation, prior to him taking on flesh, before the truly divine Son of God, that second person of the eternal trinity took on a fully human nature, he existed in eternity past, in equality with God the Father, in equality with God the Holy Spirit. According to one commentator, Richard Millick, the phrase, who being the in the nature God, means in the outward appearance, which was consistent and true, a form perfectly expresses the inner reality of who he was in eternity. This pre-incarnate, before he became flesh, existed to fur and further described in the following phrase, he did not think equality with God something to take advantage of. So before coming to earth, the Son, who was fully divine in his nature and his attributes, Jesus Christ was never lesser than God the Father and never lesser than God the Holy Spirit. He was equal in the triune Godhead. The idea of full deity in the Son of God is taught elsewhere in the New Testament. In fact, Christ taught it himself when he prayed for his disciples in John chapter 17, verse 5. He says, Now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. And in describing Jesus, the Apostle John wrote in the very first verse of his epistle, he says, in the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And even the author of Hebrews, who we're not sure who was the author, but he wrote of this character of Jesus Christ and affirms this, that God the Son is, the Son radiates, radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God in Hebrews 1 verse 3. But what does it mean that Christ did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage in verse 6? The noun translated used to his own advantage is harpagmos, and it occurs only once here in the New Testament. Outside of the New Testament, it was used in common language, but it had a, more of a negative context. It refers to an act of robbery or loot that's gained by plundering. But as we look here on this verse 6, it can have that meaning here. Christ couldn't have tried to rob God of his divine power. His divine power is something that the Son possessed as the eternal Son to the, of the eternal Father. So positively, this noun, hypagmos, can mean something like a great benefit or a favorable lot. It's like the glory or the power that a prince might have just being the son of a king. In this case, the statement that Christ did not regard equality with God to be hypagmos would mean that even though the eternal Son had all the glory, all the honor, all the power and title of deity, they are his by his very nature, he did not take an attitude or mindset of some sort of spoiled brat who would bask in that glory. Another commentator by the name of Hansen translates this enigmatic verse along these lines. <laughs> The one existing in the form of God did not consider it an advantage to exploit to be equal with God. Though he could have clutched onto his heavenly glory in eternity past with the Father before time began, and he had every right to do so, he didn't. You see, Christ voluntarily acted on the attitude and mindset of selfless humility not with the air of self-focused superiority. And along these lines, I like the words of Clement, who was a first century leader in the Church of Rome. He was a contemporary of Paul, and Paul mentions him in Philippians chapter 4, verse 3, as a fellow worker. 
And in his own letter, Clement's own letter that he wrote to the churches, urging Christians' humility is seen sort of reflecting this Christ hymn that Paul wrote about. And he writes, For Christ is those who are humble-minded, not those who exalt themselves above their flock. The scepter of the majesty of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, did not come with pomp of arrogance or pride, although he could have, but with humble-mindedness. And that's found in 1 Clement chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, as a letter Clement wrote to the churches. Think about this. God the Son, the all-powerful, the eternal, didn't regard his exalted position as part of that Godhead, as something to be used for his own advantage, saying, well, I'm not going to become a sacrifice for humanity. Nothing within him tempted him to exploit his position his preeminent position as absolute sovereign over all. He was the creator of the heavens and the earth. And why not? Because in his perfect love for humanity, for you and for me, was manifested in selfless humility. In the state of absolute perfection and complete control, Jesus, in eternity past, stepped out of eternity, stepped out of heaven, and willingly stepped into the rightful, from his rightful realm and glory for the sake of humanity. Though encompassed by the angelic chorus of continual perpetual praise in heaven, the Son unselfishly came to dwell among those who would later curse and abuse him. Though he was enveloped in glory all around him, his very essence expressed his glory. He would take on a veil of flesh. He became human, and fleshed and veiled his glory that he had. It did not diminish his glory, it did not extinguish it, but it did conceal it for a time. And he did it on behalf of a cold, dark world that sought to plunge him into the shadow of death. What an incomprehensible, unfathomable example of selfless humility. He who had everything and had the glory and had the right to do so chose through selfless humility to step into our world, to become one of us, to tabernacle with us, to take on our flesh. That brings us to the second movement today. The Son of God is selfless humility on earth in verses 7 and 8 because the second movement of Paul's Christ hymn portrays the heavenly sovereign as becoming an earthly sufferer. In his voluntary descent from his heavenly glory to earthly agony, Christ's humility didn't stop in the face of the, even the most excruciating form of punishment and death in the ancient world. Consider the steps that Jesus took to share our humanity and to die according to our sins, according to the Father's plan of redemption. He did it voluntarily out of selfless humility. And I have four points here, four steps that he took. The first step is he emptied himself, made himself nothing. He gave up his own divine privileges willingly, voluntarily, and he veiled himself the glory that he had in a human body. Second step, he took the form of a very nature of a bondservant. And a bondservant is someone who voluntarily becomes your slave, choosing to be enslaved for your good. He did this by becoming fully human. The third step is he humbled himself by becoming obedient unto death. He was submitted to God's plan for redemption. Between the unity of the triune Godhead, and we can't comprehend it fully, but God says the only way that we can redeem these humans is if we become one of them, and we become that perfect substitute, that perfect replacement for their sin. And that's what Christ chose to voluntarily do. And fourth, he accepted the most humiliating death of crucifixion in order to make an atonement for sinners. That means to take the place of sinners, to pay for the sins that they committed. And many scholars refer to this poetic section of Philippians as the kenosis hymn because of the vivid use of the verb kino, and because it was cast in an ancient form of a hymn to be memorized, to be recited, or to be sung. 
This kenosis hymn can be diagrammed in a V-shape, and I've included this on the front side of your bulletin insert today. In the sideways glance. So follow along as I go through this kenosis hymn that we're going through today. First, Christ started in verse 6 in divine glory. And by his choice of self-humiliation, he stepped out of heaven, out of his glory, became veiled in flesh in incarnation. That's what incarnation means in flesh. In verse 7, because he chose to do this, he, by humble obedience, followed the Lord's, the Father's plan and said, I will submit myself in obedience to your will. He died death on the cross at the bottom of the V here. But once that debt was paid, resurrection from the dead, he was given a glorified body, a body that showed and reflected his glory, but was still in human flesh. Then he was exalted in verse 9 to the right hand of God. And he's now in divine glory in the position he once held prior to coming to earth, which takes us to our third movement in this Christ hymn, the Son of God in glory after leaving the earth in verses 9 through 11. God's plan and purpose mandated that God the Son empty himself voluntarily, selflessly, and humbly, veiling himself in his inherent glory and power to take on humanity like ours, but without sin. He was subjecting himself to pain. He was subjecting himself to death, even the death of a cross, to pay for our sins. But once that debt was paid, his mission was complete. When he was on that cross, what did he cry out? It is finished. He had completed his task on earth. The debt was paid. He had given his life for ours. God raised his son from the dead in a glorified human body. He now contained the glory that he once had, but it was still robed in flesh so he could be one of us. In our future glorified bodies, we will take on the same glorified body that Christ had after his resurrection. And then he was lifted to the right hand of God, his rightful position of highest glory and honor. God not only exalted Jesus to the highest position of authority to his right hand once again, but he also bestowed on this God-man the name of the highest significance, that of the name above every name, in verse 9, he who has willingly bowed to his Father in selfless humility is now the recipient of worship. All persons bowing in subjection to him, in verse 10. Those in heaven will bow. All the, those in the unseen realm, the divine creatures or magnitudes of creatures that we don't know or understand, we refer to them as a group, as angels. But there's such a variety of angels, those angelic creatures, those divine creatures in the unseen realm. They bow to Christ, as does those who have departed for us, who have accepted Christ as their Savior, bow to Jesus Christ in heaven. Those on earth will bow, from the most critical skeptic to the most devoted saint here on earth will bow to Jesus Christ. And those under the earth will bow. Those who have chosen to reject Christ and says, I do not want the redemption that you have paid for. Those demons and Satan himself will bow to Jesus Christ as they acknowledge with absolute lordship of Christ who is at the right hand of God as God and judge and king. And verse 11 says, to the glory of God the Father. Now if Christ, who had every right to remain enthroned in a high selflessly humbled himself for others. Christ did it on his own volition. He chose to come to be us, to sacrifice himself for us. Then why would any of us, who have no right to exalt ourselves over anyone, 
would think it's okay to do otherwise. In this way, Christ becomes that perfect example, that perfect imager of selfless humility. As Paul said to the Philippians, and he says to each one of us in verse 5, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. And it was right before that kenosis him, that beautiful Christ him. He says, have the same mindset, being willing to give of yourself for the needs of others. And that brings us to our application today, this passage, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. It's how do we begin our descent into greatness? Now, Paul's argument in these 11 verses is simple. If the God-man who had the right to dwell forever in glory voluntarily and radically surrendered himself for the right of us, how could we as lowly sinners behave with anything other than selfless humility? toward others who are beneath us. There's no one beneath us. In God's sight, we are all one. It's a classical argument from the greater to the lesser, which we looked at in the book of Hebrews a couple times. Today's question is whether we will follow Christ's example of a radical humility by voluntarily and joyfully humbling ourselves, becoming servants of others rather than kings of ourselves. Now, to apply this Christ-centered principle more personally and specifically, I want to do a little practice here. Let's return to the verses 3 and 4 of this chapter in a paraphrase. And listen as I read this paraphrase, but personalize it. I've left a couple blanks there in those verses under application in your bulletin insert. And in that blank, when I get to those blanks, think of a person that you have a real problem with a problem getting along with, that you just don't want to deal with that person. It could be a fellow church member, it could be a spouse, it could be a child, a parent, a sibling, another relative, a friend, a boss, an employee, or a coworker. So as I read this, fill in. And if you don't have somebody specifically that you just really have trouble with, just put in others in this, that um, blank. So let me read this. Following Christ's example, and by the Holy Spirit enablement, I will reject self-seeking glory and vain pride and strive to humbly regard and put the person's name or others in that as more important than myself. In the next verse, rather than constantly looking out for my own interests, I will also look out for the interest of either that person or others. And this is selfless humility that Jesus Christ had. And this is the selfless humility that Christ wants us to have. So now that we have the what and the who in place, let us prayerfully consider how we're going to do this. How will we put this commitment into practice and perceive the Holy Spirit encouragement toward a greater humility? How will we know if our attitudes and actions have changed toward a particular person or just others in general? And we don't want to wait for opportunities to put this in practice. Let us go seek out opportunities How can we selflessly, humbly serve others? We do a good job here in Putnam, reaching out and helping and sharing with others. But I know in my life, as probably in your lives, we have all room for improvement on it. So begin this week to live a Christ-like life of joyful, that's a key word, but joyful, selfless humility as we go about in our interaction with people throughout the week. Let's keep this in mind. And then next week, we'll continue our study in Philippians, focusing on joy in serving in a message titled, Working Out God's Inner Work. So if you have an opportunity, please read Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 18 in preparation for next week. Let us pray. Father, We thank you for this Christ hymn that we've studied today. We thank you out of selfless humility that Christ stepped out of his eternal glory. He veiled himself in flesh. He paid the price that we could not pay. He paid the debt that we could not pay. And because of this, the debt was paid. And he was given a glorified body, one that we will receive in the last day when you return, when Christ returns to set up his global Eden. 
Help us this week to practice a selfless humility as we come across those that we can serve this week. Let us look for opportunities, Father. I pray that this message was a blessing and a time of learning from God's Word. Thank you so much for allowing me to be your guide, your mentor, but most importantly, I am your friend as I serve you through the Wisdom Trek Podcast and Journal each day. And as we take this trek of life together, let us always live abundantly, love unconditionally, listen intentionally, learn continuously, lend to others generously, lead with integrity, and leave a living legacy each day. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, reminding you to keep moving forward, enjoy your journey, and create a great day every day. See you next time for more wisdom from God's Word.